So Professor uh, Clark Hussain is at the um, uh, he's an uh, he's a faculty in the Department of Applied Sciences at BML Munjal University. So he got his PhD from IIT Kanpur, and his research interests are in uh, PDEs, numerical analysis, fractal geometry, and parallel and scientific computing. So today he will talk about some topics related to Stokes equation. Uh, so please, uh, you can begin. Thank you, Praveen and Venki, for giving me this opportunity to speak here. So this uh, talk is on <coughs> Stokes equation with non-standard boundary conditions in three dimensions. And this is part of an ongoing work uh, with one of my friend, Dr. Suvashi Mahapatra, who was also a student of Professor Praveer at IIT Khan. She is currently faculty at Triple IIT Delhi. So before I start uh, this uh, talk, uh, if you allow me, Praveen, can I say a few words about my memories with Professor Vasu? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I actually met Professor Vasu uh, in the year 2005 when I was a young PhD student. And I was just completing my coursework. So he came to IIT Kanpur for some professional visit, maybe some talk or uh, for some viva. So I met him in canteen where my PhD guide and he was sitting together. My guide asked him that I'm assigning Vasu as your PhD thesis co-supervisor. So uh, I was too young. I didn't even understood it very well. So I said, sir, what do you want to add an external you know, uh, faculty member as a co-supervisor? He said, because uh, before you joined me, I was already working on this problem, <laughs> which is a thesis problem. And I have written some complex estimates and uh, uh, only a person like Vasu can, you know, verify those estimates rigorously. So that was the impression of uh, the genius of Professor Vasu on, on Prabir Dutt. And he immediately agreed. And so that was a very humble beginning uh, of my association with Vasu sir. After that, I met him a number of times <clears throat> at uh, TFR whenever I had some difficulties or in some other events also. So I met him a number of times. He made a lot of suggestions in my PhD thesis and some suggestions for future work also. So he has impacted me both personally and professionally. One day when I completed my thesis, I met him once again. Uh, so I was young as a faculty. So, uh, you know, that happens in the beginning. Uh, I was not happy with my position. So I asked him, sir, I'm not happy with this present position. I want to change my job. He said, why do you want to change the job? I said, because there is a lot of, you know, internal issues, politics, blah, blah. So he just said one small sentence. He said, problems are everywhere, wherever you go. So that tells me a lot of things about his, you know, not as a person, but as a mentor also. So he was an excellent person. These two pictures, uh, one is Professor Prabir, which I took in January 2011 on the day of my PhD thesis defense and Professor Vasu, to whom I met once in TFR in 2008. Unfortunately, I lost both of them within a span of six months. So it's a big loss for me, which I know I, I will never be able to uh, forget. So let us start this uh, uh, presentation. So uh, as I said, the talk is on three-dimensional stocks problem with non-standard non boundary conditions. So there are some methods which have been proposed for 3D stocks problems, but most of them discuss either Dritchley or mixed type boundary conditions. So recently, <laughs> Subhashri told me that why don't we work on some uh, different type of boundary conditions which are non-standard. So we actually started this work very recently. Uh, it's from January 22. So the goal of this uh, 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 work is to apply and investigate an exponentially accurate spectral element method for a Stokes equation with non-standard boundary conditions. And uh, some introduction to spectral element method and HP methods. So most of us know that HP version of the finite element method was developed by Babuska and Go and some others in late 90s. Uh, which appeared in a series of papers in Siam Journal on Numerical Analysis. 
and uh, hp version of spectral element method is just a higher order <coughs> version of the hp finite element method the good thing with the spectral element method is that they delivers uh, spectral or what you call it exponential convergence provided you nicely design your numerical scheme and properly refine the mesh and it's a well known fact that they deliver exponential convergence which has also been established at this famous book by arnya dagis and chairman and there are some good uh, features of least square method there are some disadvantages also so the good news is that <clears throat> they are well suited for numerical solution of pdes because uh, you can apply them to a set of over determined equations which is the case in our problem also and they always give you some solution and but yes there is a bad thing also that for second order problems the convergence of the method will depend on the convergence of the second order derivative which is not the case in the galerkin approach so you need to compute derivatives one order extra in least square methods but again there is a good thing that they give rise to symmetric positive definite matrices and they can be applied for problems on complicated geometries but there is an issue once again that this least square method usually give rise to full matrices and therefore they are more ill conditioned as compared to the galerkin methods but you can take care of this uh, deficiency by properly designing some good preconditioners so that we have done so that's not an issue ill conditioning of the problem is not going to be an issue and the least square spectral element method is a, a very promising numerical method which was developed by root and garetsma and potanza and reddy in a series of papers which appeared in journal of computational physics and they combined the generality of the finite element method with accuracy of the spectral element method so it's kind of a hybrid method and several papers have appeared over last two decades which have applied least square spectral element method to a class of interesting problems however the implementation of this method to stokes problems has been really really limited so our purpose is to explore the method for stokes problem in three dimensions on different types of problems with different boundary conditions different types of domains so our computational approach is to minimize a least square functional and it's a non conforming method we will use higher order spectral element functions and then finally we will apply the precondition conjugate gradient method to solve normal equations which we obtain from the least square formulation so some uh, additional papers which uh, recently appeared on non conforming least square spectral element method for stokes equations in non smooth domain so this was a work done by again subhashri professor dat uh, rakesh kumar and garetsma uh, this uh, was a 2d problem so they have solved this for on non smooth domains as well and then there is another paper which uh, appeared for osin equations and it was again subhashri and professor uh, ganeshan from iic bangalore so that was also one of the paper on non conforming least square spectral element method so we'll take a domain omega which is a bounded open subset of class c2 and wmp omega will denote the usual sublob space uh, of uh, order m and uh, hm omega is the sublob space when m is 2 so with the uh, usual sublob norm having l2 functions whose derivatives are in uh, having lp functions whose derivatives are also in lp for all the derivatives order up to m so then uh, uh, we will define a new norm uh, which we call the fractional sublob norm and this norm we will use uh, on the master elements when the master element e is uh, a square so if you see this norm is just like uh, the usual fractional sublob norm the only difference is that uh, this has been modified in such a way that it is computationally efficient so when uh, let's say i uh, i impose the trishley boundary condition sigma will be half sorry sigma will be 3 by 2 uh, because i will take h 3 half norm so then 1 plus 2 sigma uh, will become uh, power 4 uh, and when i impose kind of a, a nyman or a curl type boundary condition it will sigma will be half so it will become just a square in the denominator so this is uh, a very efficient norm 
for computational purpose and uh, this norm i have taken uh, from uh, uh, the norms which we defined uh, in my thesis uh, and uh, it is one of the norms which we actually defined a series of norms in in that thesis uh, and these are anisotropic norms so depending on the type of uh, singularity present in the domain you can use a different norm in each coordinate direction though this one is isotropic but uh, it is coming from that series of norms which we have defined in this thesis okay so let us consider a stokes equation with non standard boundary conditions so consider a stationary stokes equation minus laplace of u plus grad of p is equal to f and this is the continuity equation together with the boundary conditions u dot n equal to g dot n on some part of the boundary and curl u cross n equal to h cross n on other part of the boundary so i have not distinguished gamma with gamma 0 and gamma 1 but it is understood from the context that on some part of the boundary we are applying the first set of boundary condition given by equation 3 and on the other part of the domain we are applying uh, the boundary condition given by equation 4 so these are not falling into the category of a standard dirichlet and mixed and nyman boundary conditions here as usual the u is the velocity field p is the pressure field and f is an l2 function and n is actually normal to the boundary so uh, this type of boundary conditions have appeared before obviously so and uh, a comprehensive study of stokes and navier stokes equations with non standard and non homogeneous boundary conditions was done by beck konka and pronu uh, on a variety of domains so in in their work you can find lot of uh, regularity estimates on stokes and navier stokes equations with these non standard boundary conditions both homogeneous as well as non homogeneous and these are important type of boundary condition because they appear in practical applications such as fluid dynamics electromagnetic field applications and decomposition of vector fields so it seems that other than the standard boundary condition it is good to look at non standard boundary conditions so we have this uh, regularity estimate for uh, the solutions of uh, the stokes equation so if f is in l2 and h is in h half and g is in h3 by 2 uh, the trace spaces then the stokes problem has a unique solution up which belongs to the product space h2 cross h1 and there exists a positive constant and uh, which set is uh, so that the solution satisfy this standard stability estimate so the solution u and the h2 norm of u and h1 norm of the pressure is bounded by l2 norm of f and h half norm of h cross n and h3 half norm of g dot n this estimate can be found in these papers in these books by uh, raviard and griswold and in many other papers so regularity for these kind of problems uh, is never an issue it is available that was also one of the reason why we thought of you know immediately started working on it once uh, we go to realize that there are these kind of good boundary conditions to look at we are also considering stokes equation with navier type boundary conditions which, which are slightly more general and uh, these boundary conditions were given by long ago uh, by navier around uh, two centuries ago i think in 1823 in one of the paper navier wrote Uh, stokes uh, and navier stokes equations with these type of boundary conditions uh, even more general than these so these boundary conditions are just you know a particular case of the most general type of navier boundary conditions here d denotes the rate of the strain tensor and alpha is the coefficient which measures the tendency of the fluid to slip from the boundary and we call it friction coefficient and n and tau as usual are the outward normal and the tangential vector to the boundary gamma so for this type of uh, stokes equation once again the regularity result is available and uh, this is available in one of the paper of acevedo and konka and ghosh and some other papers also have used this uh, regularity estimate that if f is in l2 h is in h half and alpha belong to l2 gamma so basically alpha belong to l of pt where um, uh, uh, this depends uh, Uh, p, uh, p depends on uh, on uh, t so here because it's a simple problem so we have just uh, taken p equal to 2 so it is i can take alpha is in l2 
but for computational purpose we have taken alpha equal to constant so then uh, the stokes problem has a unique solution which again belongs to the product space h2 cross h1 and there exists a positive constant which is independent of this alpha in fact in this uh, uh, paper of acevedo and uh, konka and gosh they have uh, done very rigorous estimates uh, with this uh, friction constant alpha and they have given a lot of results which can be used at different type of you know uh, applications so it's a very interesting paper to read all right so we will denote lup as minus of laplace of u plus grad of p and du we will denote by minus of grad dot u and gamma uh, sorry the outward no normal n we will take as n1 n2 n3 so we divide our domain omega which is a nice smooth domain with sufficient regularity into a set of curvilinear hexahedrons tetrahedrons and prisms and uh, by a well known fact uh, that a tetrahedron can be divided into four hexahedrons and a prism can be divided into three hexahedrons so we can always assume that all the elements in our computations are hexahedrons in fact uh, schwab uh, published this for the first time that a tetrahedron can be divided into four hexahedrons in his paper which appeared in some journal on numerical analysis in 2013 uh, but yes professor pravir has told me that this is possible to do long ago in 2006 itself and this picture we uh, generated in those times but later on uh, schwab uh, published it by showing some more uh, pictures of dividing a tetrahedron into four hexahedron and similarly dividing a prism into three hexahedrons so any domain you take in r3 you can divide it into hexahedrons so to keep the presentation and your analysis simple so we will denote w uh, as an upper bound on the degree of the approximating polynomial and because it is an hp method so we will assume that number of elements is proportional to w so we will exactly take l equal to w for computations but you can always take it proportional to w yes if your domain is non smooth then you have to be very very careful in choosing w and on each element in the domain on each element omega i in the domain we shall define a set of spectral element functions so let x uh, uh, is x1 x2 x3 and q is the master element which is the bi unit q so then there is an analytic map from omega l to q it is it is just coming from the fact that the way you can send an interval ab to the interval 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1 in the same way you can map the entire hexahedron onto the bi unit q so it is possible to do and then on each uh, q uh, so then on the reference element q you define the spectral element function as a tensor product of bundle polynomials so on the right hand side you see uh, some coefficients unknown coefficients a i j k multiplied by uh, the tensor product of bundle polynomials so for our purpose we have taken uh, legendre polynomials but uh, these are just you know any polynomials they are just the tensor product of bundle polynomials and similarly you can write the pressure as a tensor product of bundle polynomials now with this uh, definition of spectral element functions on the reference element q and hence on each hexahedron uh, in the subdivision of the domain omega we define fup as the spectral element representation of the velocity field u and the pressure field p on one of the elements omega l now we will define two quadratic forms uh, which we denote by v l w f u and u l w f u f u p and u l w f u p which will give us the residual in the pde uh, to minimize in uh, proper solomon norms and the preconditioner for uh, our uh, least square for our normal equations so to define ulw and uh, blw and ulw we need the definition of jumps at the inter element boundaries so we define jump like this uh, you take an inter element boundary so the jump is just the difference of two function values two function values for the velocity and the pressure from the left and the right and you measure it in uh, l2 norm and similarly uh, for the derivatives of the solution we define the jump once again as the difference of two 
derivatives at the left part, part of the boundary and at the right part of the boundary. So, and you measure it in H half norm and similarly for the pressure. So these are a standard, uh, you know, way of uh, calculating jump at the inter element boundary and then minimizing it in L to norm. So then we define the quadratic form BLW. BLW is the sum of L2 norms of the differential operator L on all the elements omega L inside omega and then sum of the H1 norm of uh, du inside all the elements in omega L. And then these three terms denotes the jumps at the inter-element boundaries in the function u, I mean the velocity field and the uh, pressure p. And the last term denotes uh, the boundary term ul. So this boundary term ul basically corresponds to one of the boundary condition which I've imposed. Uh, I think one term is missing here which I forgot to attach summation of norm of ul which is uh, in the h half norm on each of each face uh, on the inter on the boundary of the domain omega. So one term is missing here. Then you define the quadratic form U L W. So U L W. Sorry, this is a typo error. This is not V. This is U. U L W F U P is uh, the sum of L two norm of U, uh, H2 norm of U and the sum of uh, uh, one H1 norm of the pressure over all uh, elements in omega. So I have written it as a, an H2 norm over Q, but that's fine. You can replace it with the uh, uh, H2 norm over omega L and H1 norm over uh, omega L. The point is that you know, for computational purpose, we are taking this uh, reference element so it is enough to write just norm of u, h2 norm of u plus h1 norm of p. It can be shown that there exists a new, pre so this is not a, a diagonal preconditioner, so it can slow down the computation, So, but it can be shown that there exists a new preconditioner which can be diagonalized using separation of variables technique and hence easy to invert. So for simulation purpose, we have used that diagonal preconditioner which uh, also has already appeared in one of uh, the papers which I wrote uh, somewhere around 2015. All right, so then we have our main stability theorem. It says that the quadratic form ULWFU is bounded by C1 times, <laughs> bounded from uh, above by C1 times BLW and bounded from below by C2 times log W square. So this stability estimate tells us that we can use ULW as a preconditioner for the quadratic form BLW and the condition number of the uh, precondition system varies like log W square. So, so this tells you that the condition number is not very large even if you are choosing a very high order polynomial because it varies just like log W whole square. All right, so then we will use our quadratic form BLW to define the now functional RLW FUP, which will give us the residual in the PD, residual in the boundary conditions. So these are just some standard uh, uh, Jacobian definitions. We can skip it. Let us go to the uh, residual R. So R denotes the residual, and this is defined by the residual in the partial differential equation. So I'm now subtracting from the differential operator L, the right hand side function. FL and uh, minima and taking its uh, L2 norm, obviously because uh, L already contains uh, the derivatives of U up to order two. And uh, this one gives me the residual in the continuity equation. Uh, here HL is zero for this problem because we have not uh, taken anything on the, I mean, uh, the we have taken incompressible fluid. So HL is zero and these three terms gives us the jumps uh, at the inter-element boundary. So they already count the residual from the left to the right, top to bottom, front to back. So these three terms gives the residual at the inter-element boundary in the solution, its derivatives and the pressure variable P. And the last two terms gives us the residual in the boundary condition at the interface of the boundary phases, only the boundary phases. So the here gamma Li 
is inside the boundary of the domain omega. Here, gamma Li is inside the interior of omega because this uh, these three terms are for inter-element boundary and these two terms are for the natural boundary of your domain omega. So then, once we define the functional RLW, the numerical scheme goes as follows. Find unique F in the space of spectral element functions, which we denote by pi LW, which minimizes the functional RLW over all spectral element function representations of the solution U and the pressure P in the space of spectral element functions. And next we have the error estimate. Error estimate tells us that let FZQ, because being a least square problem, this solution, uh, there will be a unique minimizer uh, in the space of spectral element functions for this functional RLW. So let FZQ is that unique minimizer of RLW. Then for W large enough, you can find some constant C and B which are independent of the polynomial order W so that uh, the, the error in the solution and the error in the pressure and their H2 and H1 norm respectively are bounded by C into E to the power minus BW. So this tells me that error in the velocity field and error in the pressure value decays exponentially. You can also write this uh, error estimate with respect to the number of degrees of freedom. So there are order of one elements in omega because we are assuming N is proportional, L is proportional to W. So there are order of one elements in omega and each element has, element has roughly order of W cube degrees of freedom. So the same error estimate with respect to the number of degrees of freedom becomes C into E to the power minus B N to the power one by three, where N denotes the number of degrees of freedom. And uh, so this is for only for a regular nice smooth domain. If the domain is non-smooth, then depending on the type of Singularity present in the domain, this estimate will vary. And the worst such estimate will be n to the power uh, one by five when you have a very complex singularity, which we call uh, a combined vertex edge singularity. Otherwise, uh, at the best, you can do it just n to the power one by three. You cannot make it c into e to the power minus n, minus b into n uh, for a regular domain also. So best you can do is one by three. So we have used PCGM to uh, find the solution, uh, I mean solving uh, the normal equations. And the precondition consists of three blocks for each element. First two blocks corresponds to H2 norm of spectral element functions uh, for the velocity variable. And third block correspond to H1 norm of spectral element function defined for the pressure variable. Uh, basically, it should be four blocks, sorry, not three, but four blocks. First three for H2 norm of the spectral element function defined for the velocity variable because there are three velocity variables, U1, U2, U3. And the fourth block will correspond to H1 norm of spectral element function for the pressure variable. And there need to be some information exchanged on the inter-element boundary, but that inter-processor communication will be small. So let omega is the standard by unit cube and EU denote the error which we commit in the velocity, EB denote the error which we commit in the pressure and EC is the error which we commit in the continuity equation. We are setting pressure to be zero at one, one, one to ensure uniqueness for the pressure variable. And uh, because this is part of an ongoing work, so we have, uh, we are still uh, computing these numerical results. So, so far we have just uh, retain a sequential code and uh, with h equal to 2. Uh, so I will just show you the results which we have done till last week because it is part of an ongoing work. So we are still uh, modifying the code for and making it fully parallel. So this is our computational domain as of now. Of course, we are going to divide into more and more elements. So when I take h equal to 1, it will be divided into 8 elements. When I take h equal to half, it will be divided into 27 elements and continue like that. So the model problem is uh, the Stokes equation, which I introduced in the beginning with the non-standard boundary conditions three and four, uh, with 
the following set of XZ solutions U1, U2, U3, and the pressure P. This example was considered by Juan and Liang in uh, another paper we captured in SIAM, but uh, they took it with not with non standard boundary condition, with just a standard boundary condition. So we just thought of, you know, taking this example because it is a nice example to look at, though it is an algebraic solution, but you can see uh, the polynomial order is uh, 3, 5, and 3, 8. So 8 degree polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree 8. Sorry, nine because this is one minus x square. So it is good to look at how the method will perform on a solution having such a higher degree uh, in the polynomial. So these are some um, estimates which I calculated for this uh, these uh, velocity field um, u, which contains the three velocity variables u1, u2, u3, and the pressure. Just to tell you that how complex it is becoming slowly to get all these estimates and then incorporating uh, these non-standard boundary condition curl u cross n for each face of the hexahedron and then carefully looking at the transfer of boundary values from one, uh, one part uh, of the interelement boundary to another part. So it is quite complex uh, calculation. So we ran the code for uh, polynomial degrees four to 10 and we obtain the following relative errors in the uh, velocity and in the pressure. So you can see that uh, it is approximating quite well with a polynomial degree 10, because it's a polynomial of degree nine, so we are approximating it with a polynomial of degree 10. So it is uh, converging well. Uh, yes, there is looks to be some issue with the number of iterations, which I'm still not happy, but uh, we will try to see how it goes um, in near future because uh, we are just working on this. So we'll try to see if uh, uh, it can be improved further. And this is uh, the error in the continuity equation, which is decaying um, uh, nicely with a polynomial order W equal to and almost close to the single precision of the machine. We also took another example, which is not an algebraic polynomial, but a transcendental function, and then uh, again, we in, uh, applied our method to this uh, set of solutions for the same problem um, with the uh, non-standard boundary conditions three and four, the curl type boundary conditions. And these are the results. So for this problem, uh, obviously you expect less accuracy because uh, the functions uh, are now no more uh, that good uh, algebraic polynomials. So you are approximating, uh, of course they are as smooth as well. So you are approximating transcendental polynomials in sine and cosine with just polynomials. So you do not expect it to be that good the way we obtained for model problem one. Uh, but yes, when you take uh, higher order polynomial, it should give you good accuracy, which we have not yet computed, but uh, we will do it certainly for We'll try to do it for 16 or 20 degree polynomial to see how it is decaying. So th these are the two uh, problems which we have uh, um, computed numerical results so far. And uh, some part of the future work which we are planning uh, again on non-standard boundary conditions and Navier type boundary conditions is to consider Navier-Stokes equation, which are stationary Navier-Stokes equations with uh, non-standard boundary conditions and Navier type boundary conditions and stroke equations on non-smooth domains with non-standard boundary conditions. So uh, for 2D, it has been already done, but for 3D, it is not yet done. Some regularity estimates are available, which are published recently. So we are thinking to look at this problem also in near future, as well as we plan to consider non-linear boundary conditions, which are Li, boundary condition of friction type, friction type, and slip boundary condition of friction type. And these type of boundary conditions have also been considered before by other authors, by Saito and Fujita and others uh, in 2004 and in 2002, and in some other papers also. So it is possible to consider a big class of boundary conditions for stationary stokes and never stokes equations. And we are hoping that the method is going to work very well on all these, with these different types of non-standard boundary conditions. 
as well as on non smooth domains with obviously suitable modifications and uh, i thank you for your kind attention if there are questions i will be happy to answer yeah thanks a lot aklak um, so we have time for many questions um, so if participants have any questions please go ahead and ask also if you allow me by the time participant will be ready with their questions i can also show you some of my work which i have done recently in fractal geometry because this is also somewhere connected to motivation by professor vas and professor praveen mm -hmm. it is just do okay. these slides okay so sometime back when i met both of them at different places they were asking me uh, why are you always working in partial differential equation or numerical analysis why don't you try some different field of research so i told them it's not easy to switch to some you know new field it's not easy you have to devote a lot of time but then uh, 3 years ago you know, i was teaching a course on introduction to fractal geometry to my btech students and some of them got uh, very motivated when i was teaching this course so they said that sir let us do some work in fractal geometry then we started thinking and we started reading more books more papers and recently i mean in december last year i was able to get these uh, very nice uh, fractal uh, tiles these are called tiles because you can put copies of these guys together and you can fill entire space r2 so uh, the one on the right was actually known before and uh, it's not that we are the first who generated this the word but the one on the left i think has not appeared anywhere before so but these were generated by uh, some other methods we generated these reptiles using uh reflections and rotations so basically these are only reflection reptiles so you take uh, just uh, for simple uh, fine mappings and you apply the method what is called uh, the iterated function system method and you can generate these reptiles so each of these reptile has a host of dimension equal to 2 which is also equal to the fractal dimension here and this paper is with one of my senior who was also my senior at iit kanpur but he was an expert in fractal theory so it is in the review another paper very interesting paper which we have published last year is uh, uh, this appeared in the scientific reports in the nature journal and we computed the fractal dimension of the coastline of australia which turned out to be 1.143 and it was an open problem from uh, 1961 i guess when mendel brought computed the fractal dimension of the coastline of australia using the divider method and after that uh, there has been several papers which computed the fractal dimension of different coastlines but uh, nobody calculated the coast for coastline of australia maybe one reason could be it is too large in land it is 26000 kilometers so it's not easy to write an algorithm which can crawl on such a you know big coast line so we applied what is known as the box counting method to compute the fractal dimension and it came uh, from one of my student a btech student currently he is working with some company in us who designed this excellent algorithm to cover the entire coast line by boxes of uh, various scales and then you apply the method and count the boxes and you compute the value of the fractal dimension then we thought of computing the fractal dimension of coastline of our own country i mean india so after this paper happened in 2021 we implemented the same algorithm for computing the coastline uh, fractal dimension of entire land frontier and coastline uh, means the entire border of india as well as the coastline of india west coast of india and east coast of india so as you know you are situated at uh, the east uh, as the west coast of india so the fractal dimension of that west coast is 1.127 and this paper appeared recently in february in computers and geosciences and uh, in future we want to compute the fractal dimension of uh, mars uh, and the moon because these two are uh, the motivation is that uh, among all other planets uh, moon and the mars are the most Uh, you know interesting planets on which lot of research is going on people are trying to find the evidences of life on these two planets so 
we thought of you know computing fractal dimension of these two planets for that we need very high resolution maps of these planets so we have got some data from nasa satellites and for this purpose we are going to use another uh, less popular method this is known as fractal interpolation function method so this can be exploited to compute fractal dimension of very large natural objects so we are planning to do this in near future so these are just you know some insights into part of parallel work ongoing in the fractal geometry thank you